So we, we picked up many different themes there about the role of capitalism and the need for society to function in a certain way. We picked up the, the romantic tradition. We picked up the issue of uh, sex becoming commodified through pornography, but then also uh, anyone who was not participating in the, the great heterosexual <laughs> view was seen as purely concerned with sex. So there's a lot of issues. But I, I want to come to the first theme that we're going to deal with and, and ask about wh why would people think there was a necessary condition uh, that, that you know, was built into uh, sex being attached to love? Why would we think there was a necessary connection between love and sex? Well, as I said uh, earlier, actually, uh, we only thought that because that's what we were taught from about 1920. I don't actually uh, believe that there's any connection between uh, love and sex at all. Uh, in fact, I've often thought they were opposites. And I don't, I'm not alone in that. The Victorians thought they were opposites for a start. But also the Greeks did. And this is little known because everybody loves the story, Aristophanes' myth about, you know, um, splitting a human being. They used to have four legs, four, you know, they were split down the middle and then they find each other again. And the myth is quoted everywhere in all books that love sex, saying, oh, this is amazing. This is finding your soulmate. But actually, um, Aristophanes was talking really only about the love that a man can have for a boy, which that was the supreme love. And if you, you know, heterosexual, you'd like, you'd like, you'd like this. Heterosexual sex was <coughs> really considered beyond the pale. I mean, lesbians came second. They were okay because they were a bit spiritual, if you like. They liked each other as friends. They hoped to be friends forever. But heterosexual sex was really no good at all. And um, what they thought, though, was really good was philia. And philia just basically means friendship. But it's more than friendship, because they believed that friendship was about two equals. It was about mutual respect, care for one another. And they believed that friendship lasted forever, whereas eros ha, just lasted for a few, moment or two. And it was all about loving a, a beautiful body, which you would enjoy and use. And then uh, that was that. And when, actually, when I read that, I thought, well, that, I feel is com completely true. I also read recently the most fantastic definition of real love that I have ever read. It's by Pascal. It's um, connaissance du coeur, knowledge of the heart. And uh, connaissance is not like our word uh, knowledge. It's not about facts. It's about being present with somebody else. It's about paying attention to somebody else, being there. And I think when we love someone, it's a kind of recognition of a sort of essence of that person. You know them. You know them. And I think that real love is a sort of knowledge. Whereas I think sex, sex is the very opposite of that. The less you know about somebody, the sexier it is, which is why porn is so sexy. It's because they're just wearing these masks. Any inner life is so unsexy. You know, if, if, if you hear somebody's worried about, oh, I don't know, their children's child's doing badly at school, hey, you're not going to be having sex that night, are you? Real, real feelings, you know, are really unsexy. I'm, I'm going to take a hunch that John doesn't agree with that. And in fact, <laughs> and, 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 no. and in fact, and in fact um, you, you said something earlier on about it not being unsexy and it not being distancing to become more familiar, to know someone better. So you might think that familiarity breeds consent as far as you're concerned. Well, no, it's, it's, it's a play between the two, uh, as anybody who knows, if you think about the erotic, I think that that, that is clearly true. But yeah, I would take a far earthier line than, mm. than all this. You know, in the Bible, for example, you know, to know somebody is, is to have sex with them. And that is, that, you know, the, the idea that there's no link at all between uh, sex and knowledge seems to me to be wrong. It seems to be an incredibly dualistic way of looking at things, you know, as if our liking and loving 
people had nothing to do with their bodily manifestations at all. Actually, their bodily manifestations, including language, are the only things we've got to go on. You know, there's more than that. It's the gateway to the soul. But I think that inversely, the soul comes into sex. It's the sense of something hidden, if, if you like. And I, I worry that Olivia is only seeing a sexy, you know, a very debased version of sex, which you are, 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 are rightly um, uh, objecting to. And, you know, I, I don't want to concede that it's somehow natural that young boys are getting off on images of violence against women. I think that's perverse. It's, it's something has gone horribly wrong. And, and I, I think while obviously it's true that, you know, not every sexual attraction involves mad love, the idea that it doesn't involve some kind of liking, some sense of, of, of trust, something you're not put off by, you're drawn towards, it seems to me just a simplification, that everything is much more complex. You know, if it wasn't complex, sex and relationships wouldn't be so difficult. But the emotional, the intellectual, the physical are all interfused with each other. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I'm taking that as, uh, you know, the, the strong view that there's a kind of communing with each other that is for you part of, of sex. And, and yeah. Gilly, I, I think you're also resisting Olivia's view by saying that, you know, it becomes rather unsexy when you objectify. It becomes rather less satisfying when people are just in it for the sport in the 60s. So I'm certainly not yeah. advocating um, a world in which sex can only be enjoyable within a loving relationship. Of course not. I mean, I was, it, as a, a feminist in the, throughout the 80s, you know, we, there's a lot of mythology about what you might term second wave feminism, but we just call it feminism. We actually invented uh, the idea of sexual liberation for women by saying, uh, it, it, in fact, it was one of our demands of the women's liberation movement that women had a right to self-determination in terms of our sexuality. And whether that meant demanding uh, different types of sex within heterosexual relationships, monogamy, non-monogamy, um, or celibacy, it didn't matter. But what we said was that women have been told that sex is a duty, sex is, most sexual experiences um, for, for women... Um, the f first sexual experiences are not positive, which is a terrible thing to think about. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the, old, the old kind of joke of what does a lesbian bring on a first date, a Pickford's removal van and her cat, you know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of a... It's, it's a myth about the fact that, uh, that, that women who were looking for sexual liberation, which is very, very boring and demanding long-term loving relationships with which to have this very nice, uh, safe uh, sex, which isn't the case at all. Like I say, we demanded pleasure and an end to sexual violence and objectification. So what I'm saying about pornography and also the, not just pornography, as I say, it's a reflection of misogyny and it perpetuates misogyny. But this notion that women can be taught to enjoy activities that are very harmful and very unenjoyable because that's the narrative they are being fed by primarily young men and men of older generations because it is a dehumanization of women that is a wider reflection of, of, of misogyny and inequality. So, do you, Julie, do you think, moving on to the second topic, do you think, therefore, a sort of very radical separation of sex and long-term relationships is dangerous to society? I think we've been doing that forever. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.